talk about some amazing things. And I, I want to show some pictures. When Dustin asked me earlier in the day, I figured pretty pictures would, would do it. But there's a purpose, and part of it is that the, we have discovered an amazing number of things about the universe, and, uh, but it's still mysterious. And one of my favorite physicists, Richard Feynman, said that. I don't feel frightened not knowing things by being lost in a mysterious universe without any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell, and you can decide for yourself. But I, I um, if this works, yeah, okay. He, Dustin described to call it the symphony of the universe. I thought I would go back and call it the music of the spheres, which is more relevant to some to things that happened here in this room, from Kepler onward. Uh, but I, obviously, I'm going to pick and choose. And what I want to talk about is some amazing things about the universe that are surprising. Uh, and I'll pick and choose. But each time we discover something amazing about the universe, it raises more questions than it answers, as I'll show you. But now for some pretty pictures, um, because it's late in the day. This is a universe as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is now old hat. But one of the amazing things about this picture, and it still never ceases to amaze me, is except for one dot in that picture, which is a star, and you can search for it. Actually, um, actually, I see two dots, two stars. Every other dot in that picture is a galaxy. And each galaxy contains about 100 billion stars. There are 100 billion galaxies, at least in the observable universe. And it is a remarkable universe. Now, that we, we have more recent pictures. That's the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a picture of that same reason with the James Webb Space Telescope. There are more stars in it. Everything that twinkles with those, those uh, little patterns coming out of it, it's a star. The rest are galaxies. And you can see some weird shaped objects going around in a circle, galaxies that look like they're stretched around. And that, we understand, is actually due to the bending of space, the fact that matter curve space according to the general theory of relativity. And we can use that bending of space to measure amazing properties of the universe. And when we looked at this universe of 100 billion galaxies, one of the first things we're discovering now is that there are more galaxies early on in the history of the universe than we thought there should be. This does not mean the Big Bang never happened. I'll, I often read that in the press and I get about 10 questions a day by email about that. But it just means that um, our understanding of the universe at early times is evolving. But as we've looked at this picture, we've also discovered something absolutely mysterious about the universe. That while the galaxies are what we can see and the stars are what we can see, the most important stuff of the universe is the stuff we can't see in this image. First, every galaxy is surrounded by dark matter. 10 times as more stuff, much stuff doesn't shine as shines in our own galaxy. And we think that's some new type of elementary particle which is going not just out there, but in this room as you nod off during this lecture, okay, and going right through the Earth. But even more fascinating and more mysterious is the fact that the dominant stuff in the universe is empty space. That if you get rid of all of the particles and the radiation, empty space weighs something. And we don't have the slightest understanding of why. It's probably the biggest mystery in science today and something I've spent a lot of time on working on and my colleagues. But even as we have learned an incredible amount about the universe, the mysteries, the new mysteries come up, and I'll keep going on with that. But, it, but it's very important, and I'll come to this at the end, that people often misunderstand things by not knowing everything. They assume you know nothing. And, and that's a very important distinction. We should be quite clear to point out, as Dustin said earlier, and as I'll end with, that not knowing is a very important thing. But not knowing is nothing to be ashamed of. It doesn't mean you know nothing. So anyway, that's the first mystery that comes from that. This is, these, the, the a picture on the left was, was with the Hubble Space Telescope. The picture on the right is with James Webb Space Telescope. These are stellar nurseries. Stars are being born even as we speak. And we can see them born, being born and, and the region uh, at the bottom of a new star being born, clearing out the space around it, but you can begin to see a nascent solar system a material coalescing around that star, around that early nebula. And it, we are learning a tremendous amount about how stars form, but at the same time, they give us a kind of different connection to the cosmos. I heard about connections earlier, but we are actually far more connected. And it, is, it still amazes me, and, and, and I've said this often, but I'll say it again, that uh, every, every atom in your body was inside at least one star that exploded the most energetic fireworks in the universe. 
when stars explode, as in fact you can ha are happening around there, they compress gas around them in interstellar space and cause other stars to form. About five billion years ago, in our region of the galaxy, a star exploded, compressing the gas, causing it eventually to collapse into the sun and the planets around us. And not only has every atom in your body been inside of a star that exploded, but atoms in your left hand come from different stars than your right hand. So you really are stardust. In a real, true sense, you are connected to the cosmos. And we're just learning about how connected we are. For example, a mystery that was recently solved, and it was recently solved by an experiment that I'll show you in a moment, was, was, was this. Stars produce all the elements up to iron, and then they don't burn anything anymore. They can't make anything beyond iron. And we try to figure out, where do the heavy elements come from? Some of you are wearing gold. If you're wearing gold, this is an amazing fact. Gold isn't made in stars. And we used to hypothesize, we theorized, that perhaps the only place in the universe that where, where you could get the right conditions to make gold was if two neutron stars. Now, neutron stars are the dense cores of stars that have already exploded. They're so dense that they're basically giant atomic nuclei. They're, in, they're so dense that they have the mass of the sun in a region the size of Rome. Okay? If two of those objects collide, the conditions might be right to create gold. And recently, with an experiment having to do with gravitational waves, which I'll show you in a second, we were actually, after the, uh, we were able to measure the collision of two neutron stars. We first saw it because of the gravitational waves they emitted, and then every telescope on Earth looked there. And then looking out, we saw radioactive elements that decayed, and we were able to see the creation of one Earth mass amount of gold. So every, when you look at the gold, those of you who like to wear gold in your hands, think that that's where that came from. That gold could only have come in the two most exotic objects in the universe colliding, which may, may happen once every million years per galaxy. It's just, it's just remarkable. But the, the device that first saw that, and this, I want to talk about this, because this is another mystery that's kind of interesting. Because it happens every day, and it's been happening for a long time, but we were never able to see it. This is a device that was designed to see it, um, called LIGO, gravitational waves. Einstein's general theory of relativity tells you that every time I wave my hands around, I actually create waves of space and time called gravitational waves. The gravity is the weakest force in nature. You may not think that as you try and get up in the morning, but it is. It's because the whole Earth is attracting you. But each atom exerts an incredibly small gravitational attraction on every other atom. And I would love to be able to measure gravitational waves that Einstein first predicted in 1916. This device was designed to detect it. And uh, yeah, it doesn't work very well in here. But it's, it's got two arms that are four kilometers long at right angles. And if a gravitational wave comes down from the sky, it will actually literally change the length. Gravitational waves are in this room, changing the length of this room all the time. And it's, you don't notice it. Some of you who had maybe too much to drink last night notice it. But, but the rest of it, it's, it's hardly noticeable. But if you take the most energetic, cataclysmic events in the universe, two collisions of huge, massive black holes, they might produce a signal big enough to be seen in this detector. And we calculated, OK, how, if you took two huge, massive black holes in our galaxy or a nearby galaxy, what would they do? Well, the gravitational waves would come down. And the amazing thing is that it would change the length of those two arms. One arm would get shorter, one arm would get longer. Then another arm would get shorter, and the other one would get longer. It would change the length back and forth. Fine, let's look for it. Built this thing, look for it. But the change in length is amazing. We predicted that those arms would change in length. They're four kilometers long. Each one would change in length by a size one one thousandth the size of a proton. And what is amazing is we can see that. It's amazing. As a theorist, it continues to amaze me what experimentalists could do. And in September of 2015, this is an artist rendering. They discovered a signal, the very first gravitational emission, by two black holes 1.2 billion light years away. Each of these black holes, one is about 56 times the mass of the sun, and one is about 29 times the mass of the sun. And watch what happens when they collide. 
The space around it is bending, as you can see due to the gravity, but watch, there you go, a little jiggle. And during that jiggle, they, they, they saw that the, the length of arms would change a little bit, and it was a little chirp. It lasted about a second long. That was the music of the spheres. Now, what is amazing about that is that, first of all, accident. The detector was ready to be turned on, and, they, and, and my uh, friends of mine who were heads of the detector said, don't take any data. But graduate students, being graduate students, turned it on and started to detect data. And within two hours, they saw that signal, that two-second interval signal. It had been traveling for 1.2 billion years to get to us. So if they had turned on the detector three hours later, they would have missed it. The other thing is, if they had, we didn't have that detector, we would have never known about those gravitational waves. But if you actually calculate the mass of the black hole, before the two black holes before and the mass of the black hole they make together, you'll find out that three solar masses of material was turned into gravitational waves, which means during that two-second interval, that single object emitted more energy than all of the rest of the stars in the universe combined. But we never would have known about it if we hadn't have built that detector. The universe is mysterious, but we can probe things that allow us to make it a little less mysterious, but no less awesome. I'll, I'll just briefly say that our picture of the universe also tells us that the universe at early times was expanding very fast. It's a, it's a theory called inflation, but it predicts something that's equally strange. It predicts that perhaps our universe isn't all there is. That in fact, they're quite likely up to over an infinite amount of time, an infinite number of universes. And in each universe that forms in, a, in a, its own Big Bang after this period of inflation, the laws of physics can be different. And when we ask why are the laws of physics what they are, something that I as a scientist grew up wanting to, to explain why the universe has to be the way it is, the answer is it might just be an accident. That in other universes, the laws may be different. But in those other universes, stars and galaxies won't form. And if stars and galaxies won't form, then planets won't form. And if planets don't form, then people won't form. And if people won't form, then scientists won't be around to ask the question. So it could be that the universe is the way it is because we're here to observe that. Not that it was designed for our existence, but just simply an accident. If an intelligent fish were to ask, why is the universe made of water? The answer was, if it wasn't, the intelligent fish wouldn't be able to ask the question. So these new developments are, are suggesting weird and wonderful aspects of our universe. I think the last thing I'll talk about, especially given time, is time. This is a picture taken um, from Bern, Switzerland, where Einstein uh, first developed the special theory of relativity and then the general theory of relativity. Clocks are big in Switzerland, and uh, trains are big, and that's because trains help keep the time in Switzerland before eyewatches and things, because they're always on time. And it's not too surprising that Einstein, when he began to think of space and time, imagined trains to explain it. And the interesting thing is, he discovered ultimately, first with special relativity and then with general relativity, that time and space are really the same. They're different aspects of the same thing. But if that's the case, there's a, there's a mystery. Why can I go in a circle in space and not a circle in time? Why can't I travel in time? And the answer is, we don't know. This, is, this, this wormhole is a possible time machine, and to save time, I'm not going to talk about it. You can ask me later. But all of this may sound quite esoteric. But the thing I want to leave you with is that these esoteric things affect our lives. All of you, are like, if you're like me, used a GPS to get here today. But in fact, because those satellites are a, a few thousand miles above the Earth, their clocks are ticking at a different rate than the clocks on the ground. If we didn't take into account that general relativistic effect, GPS would stop working in about five minutes. You'd be a kilometer off. So these esoteric aspects of the universe that we're learning about are changing our lives in immediate ways. Now I see I'm about to end, so I'll give my conclusions. Oh, I, oh, I do. I'll suddenly have five more minutes. Well, I'll take less than five. I want to... I want to, having talked about the strangeness of the universe, I want to point out that while it's strange, we are still required to realize that we're 
restricted by science. And the things we might want to be true, such as my being able to speak Italian before COVID, is not, are not true. And one of my favorite explicators of science, Jacob Bernowski, said, dream or nightmare, we have to live our experience as it is. We have to live it awake. We live in a world which is penetrated through and through by science and which is both whole and real. We cannot turn it into a game simply by taking sides. And I, I point that out because it's very important to realize that we all want to believe, and I've heard a number of things today here that I'd like to believe, but I remain skeptical about. And we need to be skeptical of ourselves. As Feynman also said, we are the easiest people to fool ourselves. Because if we see something we want to believe in, then we tend to pick the data to believe in that. But we all have to work equally hard to prove ourselves wrong as much as we want to prove ourselves right as we try and understand this mysterious universe. It's the only way we will make progress. Now, humility and honesty demand that we be clear about the limitations of our knowledge. And I, I want to echo, in fact, what Dustin said at the beginning. We, we shouldn't be shy about this. We should celebrate it. There remain remarkable mysteries to be uncovered. I've shown you a few of them. But every day, I'm surprised if I'm not surprised when I look out at the universe. And the three most important words in science, and I began my most recent book with them, are I don't know. W teachers and parents and politicians in particular should be more willing to say that. We all, when our children ask us things, we want to give them the answer. Instead, if we don't know the answer, say I don't know. Because that is an invitation to discover. That is an invitation to discover together. And, and for me, it's, it's cosmic job security. Because each time we make a new discovery about the universe, we create new questions. And not knowing is what makes it exciting. I remember reading as a, as a young boy a book by Richard Feynman. It was the first time I realized that we didn't know everything. And it was an invitation to me to try and join that voyage of discovery. And, and I hope we can each of us give our children that same sense of awe and wonder by pointing out that we don't know everything. At the same time, and at the same time, science has made us feel insignificant and should. We are cosmically insignificant. And that's not a bad thing, because we make our own significance. And one of my favorite pictures, which if Carl Sagan had been alive, he would have done, is, a, is this picture was taken by the Cassini satellite. And it's a picture of Saturn illuminated by the sun. Now, you really can't see it. And, and, but right there inside those rings is a little dot. You look at it very carefully, you can look at the picture online on high definition. The little dot, that's the Earth, okay? And it gives you a sense, but by the time you're already out in our own solar system, outside the orbit of, of Saturn, the Earth is already uh, um, just a little speck in the cosmos. Cosmically, the universe couldn't care about us. We're here, we care about us, and, and it's up to us to make our own significance, and it is amazing that in this random place in the middle of nowhere, we are endowed with a consciousness that's, that allows us to ask those kind of questions and answer some of them, wonder about other things. And for me, that's the thing about science that's most important. It's not the new technology it cre creates, but the ideas. That makes it like art and music and literature. It changes our perspective of the place in the cosmos. And Albert Einstein said it best, the fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. So by celebrating this mysterious universe we live in, accepting that we don't know everything, but nevertheless, each day going to work and trying to get our minds open, be willing to be proved wrong, and being excited about not knowing everything makes life worth living. Thank you.